Tonight is a celebration. This is a party. It gives a chance to think about uh, uh, Roy and, and to um, mark 10 years of, of a very successful scheme. We have um, uh, four uh, contributions that we'd like to share with you. I'd like to start by inviting Shirley Williams, Baroness Williams of Crosby, who has been a, a, a lifelong colleague of, of Roy's um, and uh, has been, she's actually featured in our booklet um, as one of the Gang of Four, but uh, stands, <laughs> stands in her own right as, as a very eminent figure. And she'd like to share a few, few thoughts about Roy, Shirley. <laughs> Let me add my welcome to the welcome that Mr. Plath has given, uh, particularly to the Jenkins scholars. We're delighted to see you. And may I say, as somebody who was once a Smith Bunt scholar in the United States, that I found it completely transformed my life. There's almost nothing like living and studying and working in another country for several months or even years to establish the feeling that you partly belong to more than one country at the same time, and also that it opens your mind to all kinds of ideas that you perhaps wouldn't have encountered if you simply sat back in Germany or France or UK and didn't establish relationships outside. But I want just to say a few words about Roy. Um, Roy Jenkins was a man with the most astonishing hinterland. It's a phrase we use about politicians who, whose ideas and thoughts and knowledge goes beyond politics. And that was absolutely true of all. His hinterland included literature, and history, and philosophy, and theology, and almost everything you could imagine. He was a man that I would have called him once upon a time, a polymath, somebody who belonged to the Renaissance era, and is rather rarely seen today when so many subjects and so many intellectual uh, areas are divided up into specialisms of a very narrow kind. Let me just give you a couple of little sketches or little pictures of what Roy was like. He was obviously a man of intellectual sensibilities. He was a man with friends who came from the arts, from music, from poetry, from the theatre, from politics, from a huge wide range, because he was able to talk intelligently and thoughtfully about every one of the subjects that his friends were able to access and to dominate in the most astonishing way. But the extraordinary thing about Roy was that he could suddenly change completely into something quite different. I remember, for example, that in 19, let's see if I remember the year, yes, right in 1982, when he stood for the parliamentary constituency of Hillhead in Glasgow, <coughs> suddenly seeing this brilliant man who'd been a president of the European Commission, who'd been by any standards in the highest rank of the political elite, who had been somebody that most other people would sit and admire and feel frightened about addressing. Running up and down the great staircases of Hillhead in the terrace areas of Edinburgh in order to canvass all the people up and down those staircases to suggest that they might want to vote for the Liberal Democrats. He wasn't a man who stood on one side and let others do that work. He did it himself. He gained a very great deal from his relationship with ordinary men and women who would one day decide how to vote. And deep in his heart was a great respect for the democracy that that represented. A quite different picture. When he was Vice Chancellor, when he was to be Chancellor of Oxford, and we have, I'm glad to say, Bob Patton with us, who is the current Chancellor of Oxford, one of the things that uh, Roy liked to do was to, in a sense, challenge conformity. I always remember on one occasion having lunch with him in East Hendred, which is where Dame Jennifer was somewhere modestly in this group. Uh, they lived, especially were there at weekends. But Roy had a habit of having a delicious lunch, in addition, delicious conversation, would then suddenly say at five minutes past two, we've just got time for coffee. And you'd think, what's the hurry? 
And Roy would then leap into a car which he drove himself, which was quite properly called OWL, O-W-L, Bird of Wisdom. He would hurtle at a rather higher speed than he probably ought to to Oxford. He would leap out three minutes before some great ceremony started, grab his mortarboard out of the back of the car, which was incidentally quite a small red Ford, and would then put on a cloak and rush in to take mastery of some great memorial service as the organ began to play in St. Mary's the University Church. Very few university chancellors would risk that, would even risk having a hair out of place. But Roy found a contention between himself and the clock endlessly ticking towards some brilliant <laughs> occasion. Obviously both exciting, stimulating and challenging. He was also a man with a very wide sense of the way in which history flows. He always embarked in politics on the big picture and not the small one. He didn't get saddled with or for that matter constrained by the littlenesses, the tribalism of modern politics. He always thought more highly than that. So he became, as you know, passionately committed to the idea of the European Union. I have to say that the, in the light of the present commission, that Roy would have thought about the great aims and objectives of the history of Europe, and not just about the latest directive he didn't like. He had the capacity to raise his vision to the highest possible levels. In short, he was quite simply a very great man. But a very great man who didn't just think about what was the next step he could take to become yet more famous, yet more popular, yet better known. Indeed, the step he could have taken to become Prime Minister of this country. He didn't take, because in a way, that to him was secondary to the great historical objectives. He was a great man, a wonderful man, a man of many, many changes and colours, a rainbow man, and it's for me an honour to say that you, who are Jenkins scholars, have got quite a heavy responsibility to carry on <laughs> to build forward above all the idea that was so well expressed by Roy and others, that, uh, that above all nations is humanity. And that was something that was at the very heart of what Roy thought and what he believed. Thanks for listening.